Welcome everyone to another episode of IGN Unfiltered, my monthly-ish interview series. We are back after an unofficial hiatus and we're uh, not at home base. We are here at 343 Industries in Redmond, Washington. And I am with Joseph Staten, the creative director, the head of creative officially That's at right. Halo Infinite. That's right. Uh, it is really good to see you, my friend. I've been uh, looking forward to doing this sit down with you for quite some time. Me too. I'm glad it's finally happened, Ryan. After many years of trying to make it, yeah. make it happen, it's good. Yeah, I mean, you've had a really long and, and phenomenal career in, in and around Halo, but also other things, and we're going to cover all that. Uh, and I, but I want to start with your love of aviation. Wow. You, you okay. Yeah. Tweet a lot, and you yeah you post a lot. Yep. So you love to fly. I mean, I'm I'm sort kind of curious. What is it about that hobby that that brings you so much joy? Because it's you know there, not everybody is into going up and yeah. learning how to fly and spending time up in the air. That is true. Well, I just have to say, you might have planned to spend an hour talking about Halo, but now you've just elected to spend an hour talking about airplanes. That's so here fine. we go. Let's do it. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, in short, aviation has always been a fascination for me. I mean, when I was little, builders building model airplanes or reading books about the Battle of Britain or whatever, whatever it was just captured my imagination, that human ability to create machines that took you up into the air. Um, you know, when you work on video games and you have a family, you don't have a lot of free time. So I deferred that dream of learning how to fly for many years and ended up getting my pilot's license about five or six years ago. And now, yeah, spend my free time doing it. But why I love it so much is it's a challenge that you get better at, yeah. that you can increase your mastery, much like video games. Um, but there's a level of manageable risk. I'm not really a thrill seeker personality, but mm -hmm. I do like a little bit of risk in my life, but I love that aviation has great tools for risk management, and it's all about pushing your personal limits safely, um, coming back safely, all those kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, I enjoy the challenge, and I enjoy the mechanics of the airplane. And again, we're going to be talking about this for the next hour, we're, so feel free in. to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> buckle up. Make sure the tray tables are up and they're upright and locked position. That's right. Here we go. That's right. Uh, but no, I mean, is there a favorite? flight that you've taken? Like, is there one that stands out when I say that where you're like, oh, this, you know, for whatever reason, there was this one flight I took? Well, there's certainly memorable f flights. And I think if there are any pilots watching this, the ones that you tend to remember are the ones where you thought, you know, that was a really bad decision to go flying today. And I need to do a better job next time <laughs> of making sure my go no go list is is really buttoned up because there are unpredictable things that happen yeah. when you fly whether it's weather or traffic or those kinds of things so those are the, the memorable flights that you learn from but my favorite flights have been with my children um, just flying into mountain lakes and camping overnight and you know i'm very fortunate to be able to fly and being able to share that with the people i love is yeah those are the most memorable awesome. things to me do you have a favorite plane well, I am a co-owner of a small amphibious aircraft, um, which means it can land on the ground, it can land on water. Yeah. And living in Seattle with the tons of water and different places to fly to, it's super convenient. So yes, I am an amphib aficionado. I'm an amphibious uh, pilot. That's what I love to do. Now, you're working on Halo Infinite, but it was, was Microsoft Flight Simulator your dream game last year? Was that your game of the year? Well. Uh, my previous job at Microsoft was working for the Xbox publishing team, yes, as we'll you know. That, yeah. Yep. Okay. And so, working on flight and the years that we spent, you know, developing that in secret and then announcing it to the world, um, I wasn't on the actual flight team, but as part of the publishing team, um, was certainly involved in that process. And oh, absolutely. I mean, growing up playing flight simulators, it was a huge part of my own evolution as a as a gamer or simmer, I guess right. one of the same one of the same <laughs> thing, depending on how you look at it. Um, and yeah, just to see it come back and in such grand style using all this cool technology. And yeah, it was magical to watch it come together. And of course, it wasn't magic. It was super hard technical and artistic <laughs> design work. But um, yeah, just super impressive that Flight Sim is back. And I have a very good time when I play. Yeah, you must have been able to bring a pretty unique perspective to, uh, to that game, both well, as a player and on contributing on the development side, too. To a certain extent, although our great partners at Asobo, one of the wonderful things that they did on the project is the vast majority of the people, at least in leadership positions and other people too at their company, went out and got their pilot licenses. Nice. So once they started working on this game, they decided, you know what, we really need to understand this, you know, kinesthetically and from top to bottom. And so they went out and learned to learn to fly. So I was not by far the only, the only pilot working on that project. 
So another thing I learned about you before this is that you originally wanted to become an actor. True, kind of, but continue. Kind of, okay, yeah. so I'm just kind of curious if there was a particular actor growing up or a character or role that inspired you to want to do that. That's a multi-layered question. Um, so what I really wanted to do when I went to college um, back in Northwestern, which is a great college and has a really great theater program, is I was most interested in playwriting mm -hmm. and just play analysis. I really enjoyed the, the construction of plays, how they were written, how you interpret them, how you bring them to life, et cetera. I won't bore you with that, with that story. Um, but I happened to grow up in the Bay Area, uh, very close to a theater called Berkeley Repertory Theater, which is a wonderful American repertory theater. Um, I had an internship, internship there working in the scene shop, and I just fell in love with that whole production of, of theater, yeah. that collaboration to create art. Um, and I came in contact with a number of just great repertory local actors who no one will probably know, but you'll see them you know, in various TV shows and, and, and movies, et cetera. Um, so I wouldn't call out any, any one actor, although it delights me to no end that F. Murray Abraham, who I first saw in Angels in America um, in New York, is now on Mythic Quest, the TV <laughs> show he plays, what's his name, Longbottom, the, the author that writes the backstories of yeah. the, so here's this super great <laughs> theater actor that I've watched forever and watched his career, and now he's on the one show on TV that's all about game development. Yeah. It, it gives me, it makes me <laughs> chuckle every time he just is able to like chew the scenery and chew up his scenes, and he's just awesome in that show, so. So, uh, anyways, I don't know, we're, well, eventually we're gonna get to video games. We but are. so far this interview is amazing. Well, that's, the, the idea is that we, we learn <laughs> you more You lull me into a sense of comfort and ease before you hit me with the well, hard stuff. you know, we have a whole month of coverage to talk about the game. That's true, but I'm, that's true. I like to hear the stories behind the people that are oh. making the games. That is just as interesting to yeah. me. And for instance, there's this. There's the, the time that you applied to work at the CIA. That's true, but that, I, can't, I can't talk about that. <laughs> that is, like, how did that come about? So, yeah, so as you get to know my odd path to where I am today, um, you know, one of the things that I also um, had an interest in was military history, diplomacy. Um, I, basically, growing up, I just read everything that I could from high fantasy to sci-fi to history to, and just I had many, many interests growing up. And when I graduated from graduate school, um, I was looking for something to do that would be meaningful, um, a way that I could contribute, a way I could serve. And so I applied to a, a variety of things, the Foreign yeah. Service and, and the CIA as well. Um, neither one of those things worked out, but um, fortunately, while I was waiting for those jobs to ultimately fall through, I ended up playing a lot of video games, um, one of which was a game by a small company named Bungie called Myth. Yes. And that is how this whole, <laughs> this whole journey began. Well, uh... There was a, and there's a, relieving out a stint in there, you, you worked at your parents' winery in Northern California. You're as just well. making this more confusing for people. <laughs> well, it's just, it's, you've had, it's, you, you've had a, just an interesting journey. That's, That's true. the point. That's true. Like, That's it's, true. it's, you know, there is no single one way into yeah. the video game industry. There, there are a million different ways, and that is right. You know, even, That's right. You can take, the one person can take four different routes. Uh, that, that is absolutely right. And um, my story is definitely one of, I would say, um, falling into a career um, in an area, a craft that I loved as a fan first, yeah. and then found my own little way in um, to this actual job. But yes, I mean, to, to set things straight, my uh, family winery was a very, very small winery. Um, I think when people think about wineries, they think about you know Napa Valley and right. what was it, Falcon Crest? Was they in a winery in Falcon Crest, <laughs> that old TV show? I forget. Um, but it was basically like a farm. We, yeah. grew, we grew grapes, and those grapes happened to turn into wine. Um, but it was a very small family winery. I spent many, many weekends and summers with my, my family, my dad especially, um, my brother too, just, I mean, being up in the California wine country. Um, again, that, that's a whole other hour our conversation yeah. but well that's it's a three-hour show oh, so. oh no it's okay good good, good. <laughs> no it's yeah um, but no you mentioned that you fell and you started playing myth and that's yeah. so you you've started you ended up playing with the bungee guys online that's right. but but what I, I'm curious about is how does that connection happen in the sense that there's no voice chat back then 
Are, so, yeah. you know, there's, you're just typing, and do they just say, oh, I'm from the development team, and you, you sort of strike up, like, how does that even happen? I'm just yeah. fascinated by that. Pretty much. I mean, um, the Myth community wasn't, I mean, this is gaming back in the 90s. Yeah. And I don't know how many copies Myth sold, but I don't think it was a million. It was probably closer to 100,000. So I don't know what their peak CCU concurrent user account was, your average night in Myth, but it was yeah. probably in the thousands or maybe depending on the time of night, the hundreds. And so <laughs> depending on when you were playing, um, you just ran into the same people. And the development team played a lot because they loved the game. And I played a lot because I loved the game. And I just happened to end up in similar circles. Um, I had a, actually I've never asked Alex, Alex Stropian, the one of the co-founders of Bungie, if this is true, but I suspect it was true. Um, Alex uh, and Jason Jones, the other co-founder, both went to University of Chicago where I happened to go for graduate school. Mm -hmm. So I think we got to talking about shared educational background um, and that led to other topics and eventually uh, you know, offered to come out and, and work, work for the company. But yeah, I mean, it was just a little group of people, a small group of yeah. people, what I should it, say. Like a the, dozen people at most at I, that point in I time? I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure it was. <laughs> I'm sure, oh, the size of Bungie yeah. at that point? Yeah, yeah. Um, less than 50. Yeah, less than 50, okay. because they had the Myth team, they had the prototype um, Blam team, which would become Halo. Right. They had a publishing organization, testing organization. So uh, probably about 50 people or so, I would say. So. You find your way, you've, you've now fallen into the games industry. That's right. You're, you're working at Bungie. Yeah. Um, and here comes, so here comes Blam. It becomes yep. Halo. I mean, the story's been told a million times about Microsoft coming in and acquiring the studio and the game and all that. But yeah. I kind of want to just fast forward a little to something. I've, I've had the privilege of asking some of the other Bungie veterans about this, and mm. I want to get your perspective because yeah. I just think it's fascinating. And that is... Was there kind of like a like an oh shit moment when you realized that Halo hmm. had become just something beyond successful, like that it was this blockbuster thing? Was there was there kind of a moment that stands out for you, or did it just sort of happen in a progression enough where you kind of didn't really notice it? For me, it was more the latter. I think the important thing to keep in mind is we were all really really busy shipping yeah. Halo One. <laughs> um, we were crunching super hard. I was sleeping under my desk. Um, it, was, it was a lot of hard work to get that game out the door. Small team, um, console launch, all those kinds of things. And at the time, Halo was just one of many titles that was contending for you know, the thing that you had to, to buy, that killer yeah. application for Xbox. There was uh, Abe's Odyssey. Sure. There were a whole bunch of other games. And so we knew we had a fun game on our hand, but if I'm sure you recall, our E3 before we launched Halo wasn't super great. Our multiplayer demo had frame rate issues, and I think people looked at us and you know, squint a little bit and said, um, I don't know if this thing's gonna controller. land, controller, yeah. you know, it's gonna land super well. So we shipped it, we were all exhausted. And then I remember looking at some of the coverage, the, the news stories about the launch, and I could be misremembering these details, but I remember like Bill Gates handing a console to someone, and Times Square, yeah. and a whole the bunch of people, one. yeah, yeah. the first one, like waiting in line, and I thought, that's, that's odd. Like, it seems like a lot of people want to play this game. Um, and from there, of course, it snowballed. But until that moment where we saw fans reacting to what we'd made and just, you know, enjoying themselves, having fun, um, I personally, and I think many people, didn't, didn't truly understand the impact that we were starting to have. Yeah, because there's, you know, there's no social media at that point to get that's that right. kind of instant uh, that's reaction right. to yep. it. But, you know, are you... Was there any point where you're like... You'd have to wait for your next-gen magazine to come the next month to figure <laughs> yeah. out what the heck just or went on. Or official Xbox magazine. Or official Xbox right? magazine, you know, true. You get your true. demo disc and read all the reviews. Right. And oh, the demo disc. <laughs> those were the days. Come those, on. Those, those were really fun days. They were. It was, uh, I have many great memories working on yeah. that magazine for so many years. And, uh, and that original Xbox era. And, and Halo was a big part of that. I mean, yeah. I've, I don't know if I've ever told you the story, but like, mm. I, I talk about it on our uh, IGN Xbox show podcast Unlocked. I mean, it was... Literally, the end of every work day at OXM be roughly 5 o'clock, yeah. and usually, usually the instigator would be Frank O'Connor. Sure. Uh, you'd hear the, uh, the white sort of splash screen Bungie logo start up, and then you'd hear yep. Marty's theme. Yep. You know, the, the game had been booted up, and that was the Pavlovian signal to everyone <laughs> else. Right. 
close up shop. We're playing Halo for the last half hour to you know hour of before everybody goes home. Yeah, and I think it was that just to go back to the, what we were talking about earlier that the thing that really clicked for me in terms of uh, you know our first really taste of success was that sense of community where we could see groups of people gathering together, lugging their giant CRTs yeah. over to their friend's house, plugging in for a LAN party, just the impact that the game had on bringing people together to compete, to make friends, um, to have fun. Um, that's when, for me, seeing that small experience that we absolutely had inside of Bungie as we were playing the game, just like grow and grow exponentially. This, this broader sense of the Halo community was what really brought it home to me that we had something we had lightning in the bottle. Yeah. Now we just had to keep it. Did uh, I mean like because you you wrote most, if not all, of the game, correct? The original. Well, I think if you're gonna put anything on my tombstone, not that you should plan <laughs> to do that anytime soon, but one of the things I have said for a long time and and um, really deeply believe in is that although I was the writer of Halo One and other Halo games. Um, we were all storytellers on the team. Didn't matter if we, you were an engineer or an artist or writer, we all played a vital part in creating the story that is, that is Halo. So um, yes, I technically did the writing, but I was not the only storyteller on the team. We all were. But did, so did you feel like really confident and good about the story that you'd written? Because obviously in hindsight we all now yeah. know that we yeah. ever, we all connected a lot with with master chief and this this universe yeah. that you guys created so like did you kind of did you were you confident about the universe that that, that you were trying to create when shipping the game or was was it just sort of a thing of well yeah you know i did my best to do a neat sci-fi thing and then it just sort of took off i'm just kind yeah. of curious where where you were at before you yeah. know the powder keg exploded and it became this blockbuster thing yeah, I'll speak on behalf of all writers in the world. Um, <laughs> no, I was terrified. I wasn't confident at all. I wanted to rewrite the whole thing. I mean, it was the only thing I could really see were the, were the uh, this is not entirely true, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but I saw most acutely those, those flaws and decisions that we had to make to actually get the game out the door. Yeah. Um, like I said, we were a small team, working really hard. Um, production discipline was not our strength at that point. It was, uh, you know, just do what I needed to do to get this thing done. And I think looking back on what we did right is we did tell, uh, we created a character that many people identified with. They could put themselves into Master Chief's boots behind his anonymous helmet and they could become Master Chief. So yes, I think we succeeded there. I think we succeeded in creating a world that was full of mystery and had some questions we answered, but many more that we left unanswered. Um, it was a large world to explore. There was an interesting cast of antagonists. Um, I think mainly I look at the, the plot trade-offs that we had to make, the way we wired up the story from mission to mission. Some of the things worked really well, like the flood reveal. Um, but yeah, I mean, we had to make a lot of compromises along, along the way. And we were still learning as a team. Yeah. Like, how do you actually make an interactive story? Um, yeah, it's, it was a... It was a challenge that many of us were cracking for the first time, at least under that bright of a spot. Right. Uh, was it you or Marty or uh, both of you? Who found Steve? I know, you know, the studio was, yeah, was in Chicago was and he yep. was a radio guy in Chicago. That was Marty. Um, yeah, I mean, Steve was just one of the people that he had, he had worked with. And we knew that we, I mean, back then we weren't doing any performance capture or right. even motion capture. It was all keyframed. Um, in some cases, just me, you know, on the mouse and keyboard, like driving characters around to create cinematic animations. Um, but yeah, Marty said, "I got the guy. I, I know the perfect guy. He's got the perfect <laughs> voice for this character. His name is name is Steve." And I said, "Awesome! I got the perfect person for Cortana. Her name is Jen. We went to school together. She's awesome. She's in Seattle. Um, I, it was just people we people we knew yeah. and respected and knew could do the job really well." Wow, that's what a, I love that story. Yeah. Um, so, other than Infinite, which isn't out yet, it's obviously closest to you at the moment. Yep. Do you have a favorite Halo that you've worked on for one reason or another? Yes, I mean Halo Three ODST I knew is you were say is, that. <laughs> is my favorite, and not just because I was helping to lead that project, but for me it was. And I think any game developers that are watching will under understand this. It was the game that we made in the most stable technology base that we'd ever had. You know, it was Halo 3 ODST. It was built 
in the Halo 3 engine, yeah. very few feature changes. Um, so it was almost entirely a uh, content exercise. And we just had the flexibility to go in and create an experience, a story together that didn't have to wait for the engineers to do all their hard um, work and you know, re rebuild tools and pipelines, implement big features. Um, all of those things are a wonderful part of game development, but it just makes things challenging. It extends your timelines. So I believe the original charter for ODST was we need it in six months. Um, <laughs> Uh, Harold Ryan, our studio head at the time, famously came to me and Paul Bertone, the other project lead, and said, you know, we need it in six months. You know, just something like Halo 3, but backwards at night. And we're like, no, we're not going <laughs> to do Halo 3 backwards at night, but we get, we get what you're saying. Um, needs to be efficient. We need to reuse assets. Um, we need to be smart about the new things that we put in. Yeah. So we set up a prototype, and people saw what we were going for and believed in it enough that they said, okay, well, but now you got 12 months total. And it turns out at 12 months, um, for a variety of reasons, we ended up actually getting closer to 18. And we're able to spend those last months just layering on as much polish as we possibly could. So for me, um, in terms of stable technology, just a really tight, cohesive, happy team, everybody marching forward with the same clear vision, um, it's just a really wonderful game to work on, very different than the vast majority of other games that I've worked on. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it, it must warm your heart because there are a lot of a lot of Halo fans out there cite ODST as their favorite for one reason or another. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I can go on and on about OD, ODST, and that definitely not trying to, um, yeah, talk too much about something that I love. But it was just a really, it was an experimental game too, in many ways. I mean, when you look around you, here we are sitting in the Halo Museum with all yeah. these, you know. You just, it's very easy to see the scale and scope of, of this franchise. And it has a very big fan base, a uh, very passionate and dedicated fan base. And when you're working on a franchise like this, it's challenging to innovate. You know, it, it's very risky to, to uh, try new, new things. Um, we certainly are in Infinite, which is very exciting. We'll get but, to that. But ODST was, I mean, it was a noir detective story. Um, kind of story that I always wanted to write. The fact that I was able to do it in, in Halo was, I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, I didn't think that was going to happen in my <laughs> career. So, yes, we as a team seized that opportunity. It was just, it was just a lot of fun. And, and one more ODST question. Yep. Did, um, the, the soundtrack uh, yeah. is, is one of the, you know, probably top one or two things people yeah. remember fondly about that game. I'm just kind of curious, did... The chicken and egg thing, like, did, did the noir, did the game influence the soundtrack, or did the soundtrack influence the game as sort of you were developing yeah. it? Well, I'm going to tell the story, and since Marty's not here, he can't fight <laughs> back, and he can't disagree with me, but I'm sure you'll hear about it on Twitter if he does. But the way it, I recall that it went down is I was talking to Marty, um, Paul Bertone and I were talking to Marty, and Paul had some really cool ideas for this hub-and-spoke model design. Um, which mapped well onto the, the writing ideas I was bubbling on. And I told Marty, hey, Marty, I want to explore noir you know, in all of its themes and with its tone. And of course, a big part of noir is, is, is its soundtrack, sure. um, a jazz soundtrack. And I said, Marty, like, you know, let's talk about jazz and like, what we like. And Marty basically was like, I, you don't need to tell me anything about jazz. I, I got this. And I'll see. I'll see. Because Marty is very, you know, he, uh, you know, compositionally, like he's piano is a very strong element in what he does. And I was like, you know, talking about, you know, brass and like, you know, saxophones. And he's like, no, just calm down, saxophone man. I will, I will figure it out. I got this. Don't worry. But I was like, every time I saw Marty for about three months, I was like, hey, remember, smoky saxophone. And he just like glowered at me over his coffee cup. But to Marty's credit, he was, that's absolutely what he was doing. He was um, coming up with a very cool soundtrack, leaning into the smoky sax. And uh, yeah, just a really wonderful union of, of, of audio and, and other creative disciplines. Yep. Oh, I love that. Yep. Uh, all right, so we're moving through your history here. We're moving, yep. Um, although, actually, I was technically, I'm going to go back in time for one quick second. Halo 2, you got to answer one of the longest running burning questions that all I right. have as a, as a Halo fan. Uh, how was Halo 2 supposed to end? 
I, I think I could pretty much tell you that. Um, and actually, the funny thing is, uh, maybe, was it last summer? I can't remember. Relatively recently, I was cleaning out my basement, and I found all the old storyboards for Halo 2, including the last level of the game, which was called Earth Arc. Um, the short answer is the last level of Halo 2 contained many of the ideas that became Halo 3. Yeah. I think people have heard that, heard that story. Um, but one of the key things that happened in that last level was that the Arbiter um, went into the Earth Arc and learned some essential things about the Forerunners, um, the place of the elites in the universe, um, and it was the closure of the Arbiter's, not story, but his, his cycle from you know, a place of uh, disgrace and disillusionment and antagonism with the Master Chief to really having his eyes open to, to the truth and giving him a moment to get on top of that realization and then make a, you know, a heroic choice to continue. I won't bore you with all those details, but secretly, in my mind, Halo 2 was always the Arbiter's game. It wasn't the Master Chief's game. Halo 3 was meant to be their game together, yeah. um, but the way we originally crafted the story is the Arbiter's the one who, in the end, ended up getting that, that big moment of, of, of closure. Um, it didn't, didn't turn out exactly that way. Uh, Master Chief got stuck on a ship and had to finish the fight. Um, but you can see some of those themes, some of that storyline thread through, um, you know, it became Halo 3. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Halo movie that never happened, what, did you, to what extent were you involved with that, in that, if any? So for a couple of years, I spent a good amount of time in New Zealand. Um, maybe, oh, I want to say that I flew down, I don't know, five, six, seven wow. uh, times, like a good, every, every, other, every other month, um, I and a handful of other people went down to work with Peter Jackson and his companies to first work on a Halo movie, and then later to work through some ideas for an actual Halo video game. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a wild adventure in, into the land of, of Hollywood and, and movie making, and, uh, but also just a really wonderful opportunity to, I would hope, learn from each other, um, learn a lot of good lessons about storytelling and how to break, how to break down a plot and create characters and, you know, work with a huge art team in terms of Weta, um, Weta and, um, and on, on their side, I hope, like, learning about the constraints of video game making and what nonlinear storytelling means um, and all those things that we have to deal with. Um, I remember one thing that I said to <laughs> Peter Jackson and some other people when I were down there when they said, well, what's, like, what do you think is the fundamental difference between making a movie and making a video game? And the best thing I could come up with on the fly was, well, you know, Mr. Jackson, it's, it's kind of like if you were to let a 13-year-old, or actually a group of 13-year-olds, all armed to the teeth with paintball guns onto one of your movie sets and just like let them go for 45 minutes and then film that. Um, <laughs> because that's, I mean, I it's not entirely true, but it's kind of true, right? Like you unleash the community, you unleash players into this world that you've created, give them all the agency or a lot of the agency to guide the story however they want, certainly moment to moment. Yeah. That's very different than, and they're gonna shoot everything everywhere because it's a first person <laughs> shooter. It's like, I don't think my analogy was inaccurate. <laughs> um, but yes, it was that kind, of, that kind of year or two just spent talking through ideas and trying to better understand um, yeah, how each of us went about yeah, creating what we did. The video game that you were um, sort of informal, or at least working on to some extent, within those Halo Chronicles, was that the project name? Halo Chronicles, summer? that's right. What that's was right. that? Have you guys ever, have you ever talked about what that was? I don't think we ever have, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed oh. to, but I can, I can say um, that uh, Paul Bertone and I were working on uh, Halo Chronicles, and when that didn't happen, that's where the whole six months, you gotta make something else uh, came, came to be. Right. So that's why we originally only had six months for what became Halo 3 ODST was because we were no longer doing Chronicles. Um, we had to do something else contractually, so. And then uh, while we're just on the subject, the Showtime TV series that's yes. happening now, I'm, you know, you're a little busy with a game right yes. now, but um, have you seen any of the, anything from the show I yet? Have, have you? I have. I got to see the first two episodes the other day. Uh, Kiki Wolfkill, who's leading up that effort, was yeah, nice Trans enough. Media to, head. That's right. Yep, was nice enough to show me a couple of the episodes, me and some other people. Um, I don't think I can talk about that Fair either. Fair enough. But um, it was cool. Good. I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yep. So you also have written a couple of Halo books. 
That's you, right. You wrote That's Contact right. Harvest and yep. Shadow of Intent. Yeah. Uh, Contact Harvest, in particular, I went and looked this up, spent four weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, hmm. peaking at number three. Wow, um, who'd I beat? <laughs> That's, that I did not, did not include. Dan Brown? Right. Did I beat Dan Brown? Probably not. Maybe. You, know, I don't, you I don't never know. So. I mean, number three, you beat a lot of people. He's Dan Brown. <laughs> <laughs> but was, was that a, front, a fun process, writing a Halo book compared to, you know... <laughs> I'm laughing because like <laughs> you're laughing. It's like I mean you write, you write like no, it was terrible. I mean it was <laughs> it was the hardest thing I've ever forced my brain to do. Yeah. Um, was it 100% worth it? Absolutely. Do I look back on it very fondly? 100%. But the actual act of putting my brain through that was was incredibly incredibly hard. Um, the only thing that was harder than that was writing Shadow of Intent because it was shorter um, and. I find that writing shorter things is is just more mentally taxing. You have to be more efficient, more concise, yeah. um, get to the point. But figuring out how to write a novel, um, knowing that lots of people were going to read it, was very stressful. I mean, because it was a Halo novel, not because I wrote it. But if it's, it has Halo on the cover, you know a good number of yeah. people are going to pick it up and read it. So not only did I have that expectation, but I had high expectations for myself. It was... Yeah, it was a stressful. It was a stressful time. We sh we shouldn't talk about it anymore. It's, <laughs> so no, I'm kidding. Sounds like you won't be doing another Halo. I book. would. I would. All all kidding aside, um, having done it once or, or twice, um, you know, it's like anything. You you learn um, how to do it. I would. I would love to have the free time to <laughs> just just write someday, Ryan. Yeah. Someday. Someday. Yeah. Um, are there any nods? Any little Easter egg nods to either of those two Halo books in Infinite? You sneak that in um, when you come on as the head of creative here. Uh, no, but you never know in the future. <laughs> it is a, it is a living game now. That's right. right. It is a living. That's game. right. Um, so, well, fast forward. So you're still at Bungie. When Bungie gets its independence from Microsoft, mm -hmm. goes out on its own, and yep. and the the team, you guys all decide you put all your chips uh, in the in the all your eggs in one basket. I That's guess right. is the better right. the better uh, metaphor there. Mm -hmm into this thing called Destiny. Right. So was that an exciting time, having spent the previous number of years working on Halo after Halo? Was it a scary time, both? I'm, I'm just kind of curious to hear about your perspective during that era. Um, exciting or scary? I would say a little of both, probably. More exciting than, than scary. Um, you know, it maybe was a little more scary before we had a publishing partner. Um, once we had the publishing agreement and the money was flowing in, well, then it became more more exciting. Yeah. And then you just got to got to work. You didn't have to worry about um, how are you going to pay to keep the lights on. Um, so I, I'm taking a moment to think about it because I'm trying to think about the similarities between the beginning of Halo, which is to say, one of the most exciting times in a game is are those early months or, or years of concept development, pre-production, um, really trying to figure out what makes the game special. It's a, it's a challenging process sometimes as you all sort of roll around trying to figure out what this game is that you're creating. The, one of my fondest memories of early Destiny days is after we shipped ODST and uh, the Reach team was still working on that game, a small group of people was able to gather together and really start doing that deep concept development of what would become Destiny. We explored lots of different um, possibilities there. I think we've shared you know, concept art of a high fantasy take on what Destiny would be and a bunch of other things in, in between. But finally gelling around that idea of fantasy and science fiction combined, which isn't a wholly original idea, of course, but putting our own unique spin on it, this super exciting time as a creative person to um, start with a big word cloud of ideas and eventually refine it down into what you know destiny became. Uh, so, not to not to turn the interview into a into a bummer of a direction, but but you, here you go. Well, no, it's, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, you you left Bungie yeah. before Destiny shipped, that's and fine. I'm kind of curious if you're willing to kind of talk about that because that's you know you were <laughs> you were the design director. That's true. On Destiny. That's, that's so that true. is not an insignificant yeah. decision or an insignificant move. I, yeah. you know, was, was it, um, were, were, were the terms good? I mean, you're, you're obviously you'd been in very invested in building this new that's world. True. So, um, you know, what, what happened for you there? 
Well, as you probably noticed over the years, I haven't talked about that much. And if you talk to anybody from Bungie, you know that there are certain reasons why we can and can't be completely transparent about those details. Yeah. Um, but look, game development is like any tough creative endeavor um, where sometimes the personalities just don't work out, you know? And I think it's especially hard on everybody when you've been colleagues for many years and friends in some cases for many years. And leaving a company is one thing, but leaving behind friends and relationships is, is, a, is a, you know, definitely, definitely much more challenging. Yeah. But I think the one thing that I can say is, um, I would say it ended about as well as it could and um, I still have many friends who work on Destiny, many friends at that company, yeah. and I, I only wish them the best. Um, now, you probably had a lot of choices. You, mm. You'd been in a, uh, your resume was very impressive at that point in time. So when you are a free agent, as it were, uh, I would imagine that, that you had plenty of, of uh, people knocking on your door. You chose to come back to Microsoft That's right. in 2014 uh, in the uh, studio level kind of creative position, yeah. kind of looking at yeah. a, a lot of different games in the everything in the yeah. in the portfolio. So, uh, what attracted you to that? Well, I have to say, um, when I left Bungie, um, the first person who got in contact me with me was uh, Bonnie Bonnie Ross, uh, head of 343, um, which was very kind of Bonnie. And I can't remember exactly what she said, but she said something like, look, I know you don't want to come back and work on Halo, probably, but would you be open to just coming and talking to various you know, studio heads and seeing if there's a, a fit for you at Microsoft? Um, and I said, yeah, you know, absolutely, love to do that. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so as I was looking and talking to other companies, I went and, and spoke to everybody, but the group that most appealed to me at that time and the group that uh, eventually uh, gave me the offer was the publishing team. Um, Going back to what I said about Bungie previously, at Bungie, I was working with the same people on the same game for 15 years. You know, we were making first-person shooter Halo games for a very, very long time. And as I reflected after I left Bungie about how I wanted to grow and get better at what I do, I realized, and this may sound overly simple, but I just needed to meet new people. I just needed to go and look at different studios, uh, large studios, small studios, to see what challenges they were trying to tackle, how they overcame them, um, learn from other creative people in the industry, be exposed to, to new ideas, new ways of thinking. And the publishing team offered me that opportunity to, I mean, tr travel around the world, work with great partners like Platinum and, you know, yeah. people, people that I never, I never would have met um, if I'd stayed at Bungie. Um, and, and learn, learn from them. And so the five years I think I spent in publishing um, was a wonderful opportunity for me to expand my horizons. Um, and I think better prepare myself for the job that I'm doing now, quite frankly. Um, I don't think I would have nearly as strong um, set of skills that are needed for this head of creative job had I not gone and spent those five years in publishing and learned from other creative leaders, um, gone through tough decisions like canceling a project, um, deciding not to move forward with a project, um, all the way to the other end of the spectrum, like watching games succeed beyond expectations. Um, you know, working on Halo for a long time, you sort of begin to expect success yeah. and things to a certain extent. They're talking about old school Bungie Halo days. Right. Um, and um, maybe a little sense of entitlement creeps in. and you begin to get a little bit too comfortable, I would say. Um, you become less scrappy, less willing to innovate. Um, you don't have to sing for your supper as much any, anymore. Um, and being with teams at a different point in their evolution um, was super inspiring to see their passion and how hard they worked and the tough, tough choices they had to make. Now, unfortunately, I was in a position to, to help them um, you know, with resources, financing, marketing support, all those kinds of things. And I, I guess to make a long story short, it really rekindled that fire that I had for um, being a little more scrappy, being a little bit more innovative, being more self-critical, you know, looking at a, a big project and asking, you know, what can we continue to do to bring novelty and excitement to our community here? Well, kind of on that note, you know, the, the next time 
you were the public face of something since the bungee days when you were, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you, we'd see you on stage for yep. various things. Was uh, was Crackdown Three? That's right. That was a game. Yeah, yep. you ended up coming in on. So, what what were some of the challenges from that game? Because uh, because you know we we know that the the whole cloud powered thing right. that was a very ambitious that's right thing that uh, that demo was from let's see I have looked at 2015 is what I what mm -hmm. I have it and then the final game 2019 so yeah what you know can you kind of talk about you t about that in terms of you know that's a game like Xbox fans really wanted yeah. to be great and wanted to love there were so many of these positive memories of of the original right. yeah and uh, and like wow this you're gonna do Cloud powered yeah. destruction, that'll be neat. And, yeah. and I know game development's really hard. I mean, I, I only have an inkling of it as somebody who covers this stuff. I've never actually made a game, but yeah. I'm wondering if you can kind of speak to the, you know, that, that, that was arguably maybe your, the first kind of, I don't want to say failure, but, but that not, that yeah. Yeah. not big success. You know, yeah. you'd, ha you'd had that yeah. for years mm -hmm. at Bungie with the Halo games. That's right. Um, yeah, Crackdown. Um, I mean, it has its own connection to Halo back back yeah. in the day, um, yeah. and it was a game that had been kicked off before I joined the publishing team, and I think was one of the the maybe not the last game that shipped before I left um, publishing. I think the last one was uh, Tell Me Why, but Crackdown shipped like twenty nineteen. So one of the one of the last things in my tenure there. Um, it was a so there's always been a tension. Um, at Xbox, but both attention and an opportunity, which is we are a giant trillion dollar technology company, right? At the same time, we're an entertainment company. And it's very tricky, but there's also opportunity there to keep those two priorities synced up. And sometimes they don't sync up exactly right, um, and, but when they do, it's, it's very, very special, and it's something that only Microsoft and Xbox can, can do at scale. Right. Um, Crackdown's ambition was to be this union of this cloud-powered technology and really innovative game design. And I think in a lot of ways it did, it did succeed as a, as a proof point that, this is, that this, pos this is possible. But along the way, like many games, you have to make compromises. Sure. And things don't always turn out exactly how you planned. And the Crackdown conversation, we could probably spend an hour just talking about that. But for me, my big takeaway was, although, although you don't always get it right, when, to work here at Xbox is to always, as a creative person, keep your mind finely attuned to those opportunities to harness the power of, of Microsoft, big technology, mm -hmm. and create really novel and engaging experiences that just, like I said, are, are just frankly not possible to create anywhere else. I mean, so it was a tough it was a tough lesson to learn on yeah. Crackdown, but I, I I do not regret at all going through that process because I learned I learned so much. So a, as a writer yourself, do you are you someone who reads the reviews on your own games? Whether you know, or I mean, I, I, I know some developers do and some don't. So I'm just kind of curious. I I do, but I'm not I'm not. I think earlier on in my career, um, I certainly did. I think as you get older and you get like scarred tissue, callous, <laughs> thick, thick skin. Um, I, don't, I don't read them to uh, like make myself feel right, to better about anything. things, to validate yeah. things, yes, exactly. What I do is I read, uh, whether it's a news review or a user review, m maybe even more than um, uh, a formal press review, is to really understand why customers are either enjoying this experience or not. Um, it just, I'm very clinical when I read reviews these days. Yeah. As I try to extract common themes, um, you know, sets of data that, that sort of are coalescing around one central point, um, I'm, I'm pretty good these days uh, about just stripping all emotion out of reviews and just going directly to, okay, what, what's positive, what's negative? What can we improve, what can we not improve? Um, and I think being in that mindset, especially as you embark on a, on a live game, on a service-based game, um, as much as possible, you've got to take the emotion out and just get really crisp, really quick on on the pivots you need to, to make. And reviews are a great place, one of many great places yeah. to see some of that info. So let's talk about that live service game. Here sure. Finally. You're not here for your health. That's we, right. We, no. It's been like 45 minutes of uh, not Halo Infinite. So let's talk some Halo Infinite now. All right, let's do it. Um, I'm curious, you know, again, you've been in publishing 
Yes. You know, not, not sort of as much with boots on the ground development. That's right. So who makes the call to, to, get, to bring you on formally to Halo Infinite? Is that something where you pick up the phone? Does Bonnie call you? Because she, she had called you years before. Right. So what, how, right. you know, where, where did, how did you end up here, I guess, is what I'm curious to know. Well, I don't, I don't think Bonnie's going to be, I don't think I'm going to get in trouble for telling this story. So I think I can tell you this, this story. Um, I can already it, tell it's going to be a good story. Though. Well, I don't know. If you're, if you're wondering story. if you should it, tell it. It does good. involve an airplane, though. So we Excellent. can like take it all the way back circle, full, full yeah, circle. Exactly. Um, so quite literally, I was sitting in the cockpit of my airplane, um, a very hot day, late, late in the summer. Um, and the Halo demo, I can't remember what it was called. Internally, we call it the Ascension demo, the first uh, gameplay demo that was a, not this past the summer, but the summer before. 2020, yeah. thank you. Um, had come out and didn't land as well as we had hoped. And so because Bonnie and I are just, you know, in contact with each other, um, I just reached out and said, you know, hey, Bonnie, if there's, if there's anything I can do, you know, hey, so, sorry, you heard about the demo. Um, if there's anything I can do to help, just, just let me know. And over the years, you know, help has been, I would just come in and, you know, talk to people about yeah. the game or just, you know, um, go out and get drinks with Frank O'Connor and you're just one of my friends and just, just talk about Halo stuff. Well, so I had the conversation with, with Bonnie in the you know, cockpit of my plane and then you know, I went away for two weeks. When I came back, um, you know, help had turned into a totally different scale of, of what I thought help, help might be. And I remember opening up my laptop after I think I was on vacation and I just had like, pfft, like all, this, all this mail in my inbox about right. a developing plan to explore you know, what would it be like for me to leave publishing and come over and, and, re and really help the Halo team? But it just, it, just, it just makes me chuckle because uh, yep, I'm ha happy to help quickly turned into a brand new, brand new, brand new career. But I was uh, super excited to do it. Um, a real honor. And uh, yeah, just grateful that Bonnie, Bonnie uh, thought it was a good idea to, to give me this gig. Um, did you ever think you would officially come back and work on Halo again? Was it a thing you had in the back of your mind? Like, yeah, maybe someday, or, or had you pretty well yeah. sworn it off after, after uh, you know, Bungie separated from Microsoft? Here's the thing. Um, the way I said goodbye to Halo was thoroughly pleasant. Was that, were we talking about that, the text at the end of Halo Reach? Um, yeah, the, t the reach, less so reach for me. I mean, I did work on Halo Reach, um, but ODST, ODST, like, okay, yeah. I mean, it was this, I mean, I don't know many, how many times in life one gets the opportunity to have a, a company come to you and say, hey, just make whatever game you want, just get it done in six months, and then actually be able to make that game, and then spend another number of months, poly poly I mean, just this amazing experience to um, work with a great team to tell a story, create an experience, and be able to put Halo on the shelf in a... On your in, terms? Yeah, in our terms, I yeah. would say. And, I mean, look, the, this is a tough business. I mean, studios don't hit their milestones. They don't get funding. They shut their doors. Um, I am very aware how fortunate we all were back in the day to have the support of Xbox, be able to ship these games, have people play them, love them, demand more of them. Um, that's a really, uh, it's a privilege to have that opportunity. And I did not take that for granted when we made ODST and, and Reach. And we were able to say goodbye, I think, as a studio to Halo in a really productive, create, creatively wonderful way. No one took it away from us. No yeah. one ripped it out of our hands. We were able to say goodbye on our own terms, as you said. And so I only had pleasant memories of, of Halo. And I always thought in the back of my mind, you know, maybe I'll go back someday. And that's when I wrote the Shadow of Intent, the novella, was mm -hmm. after we, I think that was, was that after I came back to Microsoft? I think it was, yeah, back when I came back to publishing. So I, had, I, always, I always had a sense that that old ring would, would turn and I'd find my way back to it. But um, I didn't know exactly how. It, let me put it this way. It wasn't an opportunity I was actively looking for. Yeah. So I genuinely mean when I reached out and said, hey, is there anything I can do to help? That would, I mean... I, I did not expect that that would result in, in this, but I, like I said, I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. So I think, you know, Halo is, is that Halo fans have been on yeah. our own version of this ride as well of, yep, yep. of it's been what will ultimately be six years between mainline Halo That's games. That's right. Uh, this is a spiritual reboot. Yep. Uh, we had uh, the creative leads 
step away from the project mm -hmm. uh, prior to your arrival. So, mm -hmm. you know, from where the fans are sitting, it's there's you know there's a there's a lot of okay. Well, I hope we hope this is going to be great, but there's some reason for concern here. So, yeah, I'm kind of curious how to kind of crystal, help crystallize it for people. Like, sure. how much of how much change have you affected? Like, what what has sort of been your mm. um, guiding f principle uh, to to the project? Because you know there's. There's a lot of work that was done before you got here. Yeah. But you've now had this extra year since you've come on board. So I'm just kind of curious if you can kind of sum up or, or even maybe you have some specific examples that aren't. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. That are that are not like top secret story kind of spoilers that you could kind of share. of Like what have you kind of really brought to this with um, this extra year? So, and I mentioned this before when we were talking before the interview, I think yesterday we were chatting, but I'll. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again in this context, which is when I came in, I took up a couple weeks to get my feet wet, play the game, talk to people, and I came away with three things, three main things, because there were more than this, but three main things where I realized this is how I can actually help. Um, the first thing was to work with other studio leaders and Xbox leaders to get the team more time. Um, when I played the game, I knew right away, oh wow, this is, this is a really great novel expression of a Halo experience. It's a much more wide open, adventure filled, choice filled Halo experience, but it feels, it feels like Halo. That same DNA is there. It's just a wonderful new version of that. But it needs more time in the oven. We need to, we really need to get the team, which is super talented, super hardworking, just get them more time to do what they do best. So you had come on then prior to the delay? That's right. Okay. That's right. So you thought you were in the, this was going to be like a three month sprint or something and then you'd be, you'd be. Well, I mean, no, actually I, I came in and in talking with Bonnie and other studio leaders, the conversation really was, let's pause and figure out what we really need to do here. Okay. And it didn't take very long to um, dig in and realize like I said, the number one thing that would benefit this game and the team is time. Just just more time to go after this game. Um, Which this, is not a small ask given that it was supposed it to be this big launch title. It is not. That's right. A huge amount of pressure to um, stay the course. Yeah. Um, and I think um, a really wonderful example of studio leadership, Xbox leadership, doing the right thing for our fans, doing the right thing for players even though it hurt, um, uh, even though there were costs associated with that. Sure. It was 100% a player first decision, and I'm so proud of the studio and Xbox for, for making that decision. Um, and, and I was just there to help push that, push that ball. So that's the first thing I help with. The second thing I help with is really just took stock of um, mostly the campaign, um, because the campaign was the area of the two multiplayer and campaign where time would benefit it most. Um, the campaign, as you got a chance to see when you played, mm -hmm. is just, the, I mean, we say it's the largest Halo campaign we've ever made. Absolutely is. There's a huge amount of surface area. Um, multiplayer is great. It's deep. It's super fun. But it just has, doesn't have that same surface area of campaign. So I focused a lot on campaign, work with the campaign leadership to decide what are those 10 or so areas where we want to double down. Um, those areas we already believe are really, really good that we want to make great. Um, we went through a process called epics. Um, it's a, you know, just to define those areas of focus that we wanted to um, go after, and we came up with 10, 10 epics. Um, one of those epics was that we really want to make sure, and indeed this was our first epic, that everybody understands what the equipment is, where to find it, how to use it, how to have fun with it, how to upgrade it. Because equipment like the grapple shot was the big addition to the Halo sandbox. It yep. really is like the fourth leg of the three-legged stool of grenades, melee, and weapons. Yeah. Grapple shot really is that fourth, that fourth leg of the stool. So it was one of the epics where we decided to double down, um, and I helped with that process. That was number two. And the third thing that I dug in on with uh, Bonnie and other leaders was making sure we could finish this game in a way where people were healthy and 
um, energized and as best as we could ready to move into this live mode that we finished in a way that was that was good for the studio, good for our culture, good for our team. Because you'd health. lived through I had. the bad versions of that. That's right. And being a live game, it wasn't going to just, you weren't going to suffer and then it'd be over. It would, the, the, the live service element would, That's right. know, it would continue on. That's right. And, you know, we have not done that perfectly, absolutely. We still have a ton of work to do to um, get ourselves ready to run that marathon. Um, you know, we're just coming off a, a sprint, um, hopefully a, a healthy version of a, of a sprint. And now we're really taking some time to recuperate and plan for what comes um, next. As a matter of fact, I'm spending the next three days um, at an offsite talking about what comes, what comes next in terms of our live, live service, which is super exciting. Um, but that was, that was number three, is really seeing what could I do organizationally, culturally, leadership-wise to support this team to close in a healthy way. Because I... Yeah, I mean, I, ha I have seen the bad version of that, and I absolutely don't want don't want that for for the studio. And, and one of the tough choices that you made, which you know certainly the community doesn't want to hear it. But, yep. And that's that's uh, the the fact that campaign co op uh, right. and Forge yep. aren't going to make it for December eighth, and that yep. I would imagine, based on the conversation we're having, yep. that that really, if not entirely, comes yep. down to that that third element of team health. It does, and I'm going to take a deep sigh and drink deep of this last bit of my water. Because, I mean, look, I, I work on Halo, but I'm still a Halo fan. And campaign co-op is essential to the experience. Playing Halo with your friends is playing Halo, yeah. whether it's multiplayer or, or campaign. And so of all the decisions that we made that were the most difficult, delaying co-op was was very, very hard. But again, it shows the commitment of the studio, even when it's challenging, even when it hurts, to only ship experiences when they're ready, to only ship quality experiences. And that's so important for any franchise, but certainly a franchise like Halo that's been around for 20 years. If we don't maintain a high bar, if we don't commit ourselves to excellence and commit ourselves to every time we launch something, to delighting our customers, living up to their expectations, ideally exceeding our expectations, I don't think we're doing this job right. And the simple truth is co-op just wasn't, wasn't ready. And we decided to prioritize our effort in other areas. For example, we made it a priority to make sure that whatever platform you play this game on, whether it's a Xbox One that's eight years old or a brand new cutting edge PC, that the game is gonna be performant, stable, it's gonna look great, be super fun, regardless of what piece of hardware you've got yeah. in your house. And that was a more important goal than shipping co-op. And that, that's tough, right? But I think if you look at those two choices and you put yourself in a customer-first mindset, it's clear which one you should choose, even though it hurts. Um, but yeah, I love, I love co-op. I can't wait for us to ship it. Do you put pressure on yourself with this project? Are you a, are you a sort of self-pressure guy? Because, I mean, I think... Compared to your previous yeah. Halo efforts, this game you come into, um, what you maybe you don't agree and maybe you just don't feel it, but mm. you know, the, the, with Bungie you were kind of always on this wave of, of pretty universally positive momentum from yeah. one to two yeah. to three to into ODST. But here, you know, it's been a you've got the combination of a of a long gap. Uh, the, again, that six-year mm -hmm. gap it's going to be now, which is mm -hmm. the longest we've ever gone between mainline Halo games. Yeah. And uh, you're coming off of a campaign in Halo 5 that, uh, that, was, mm. that was not as well-liked by certain folks in the Halo community. Sure. I'm, I'm one of them. It was not my favorite Halo campaign. But, yeah. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, is, when you come into this, do you, I don't know, do you, do you feel pressure for the uh, with regard to those things, or do you just you just not think about it that way? Um, certainly, there's the weight of expectation, um, but I suppose I don't see it as pressure so much as and and I promise you that I mean this that I really see it as an opportunity to serve. Like, I, I am here to serve this 
franchise. We're yes. literally in a museum right now um, of 20 years of this marvelous experience that a lot of people have contributed to. I am just one person um, here. And I come in wanting to serve, wanting to do right by our fans, um, listen to their voice, um, push back when needed, um, be here for Xbox and help support the business. Um, I, I feel very lucky. I feel very lucky. And once you put yourself in that, in that mindset, um, the, the pressure in a way goes, goes, goes off. Yeah. Um, because you just lean into what's right for the fans. Like, what's the best experience? How do we keep people engaged? I, I don't feel the pressure as much as I feel energized by that opportunity. Good. And I haven't felt this excited about working in games for, for a long, long time. I mean, I started working on Bungie games back in 1998. That's, that's a while ago. Um, I'm turning 50 this year. Um, I hope I've reached a point in my life where I've gained a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of perspective and made some dumb mistakes and hopefully learned from them. Um, but one of the big things I've learned is um, when you feel pressure, you're probably making a lot more about you than you should. <laughs> when you feel the weight of expectations, you're probably listening too much to your own self-doubt or your own hang-ups. And um, when you don't feel that pressure, it means you're doing the right thing because it means you're listening to other people. Your radar's up, you're attuned to what's new opportunities, new challenges. Um, and so for me, that's, it's a good and healthy sign that I don't feel the pressure. I feel the energy. I feel the excitement. Uh, the last question I have for you is, yeah. you know, and this one might be tough to answer now as you're you know, still just trying to work hard to get to the finish yeah. line on Infinite here, but uh, are you going to stick around for a while? Or is, uh, or, or, you know, because you said you, you did say you left publishing. You know, you are That's full time here. That's true. So is this, you know, is this a, is this a permanent thing or are we just, you just kind of renting right now? Are you, <laughs> or? It's, it's what I said before. I mean, I, I have not felt this energized in a very long time. Um, we've got, which I can't talk about any of this, but we've got so many cool plans that are in the works. And I see such a great opportunity for this studio and Halo to, to be a driver of innovation again, to, to be a cultural touchstone, to, to be a game that people love, a franchise that people love to spend time with. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm genuinely excited about the opportunity here, but I'm not gonna commit to you, man, in this pressure <laughs> cooker interview, but look, Ryan, you, uh, I'm totally joking, um, yeah, I. I'm very grateful to be here, and I'm having a great time. Love it. Joseph Staten, head of creative on Halo Infinite, along with a, a very large and dedicated team here at 343 Industries. It's out December 8th. Look for it on Xbox Game Pass or uh, grab that campaign wherever fine video games are sold. Mm -hmm. Joseph, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Ryan. Happy to do it.